Well, it is a great blessing being here this morning. And like you said, we did get in last night from Mongolia. It was a 20-hour flight, and we left Ulaanbaatar at 1 p.m. on Saturday, got here at 9 p.m., but it gave me 12 more hours to study, so that was good. Um, but uh, we, like I said, are just thankful to be here and are looking forward to what the Lord has for us in Mongolia. And you know, we're called to evangelize the lost. And specifically, my wife and I are called to evangelize the lost in Mongolia and make disciples there. And this passage that we're going to be looking at in 2 Timothy, if you go ahead and open your Bibles there. And we'll talk about world missions and our calling to evangelize. I'll tell you more about our specific ministry in Mongolia after the fellowship time and get to show you just what we're doing there, what the Lord's called us to and share more about our family. But for now, if you would, in 2 Timothy. Now, as a young man entering into full-time ministry, this charge that Paul gives to Timothy has been critical to my understanding of world missions. And as Timothy has received this letter, the last time that he saw Paul, he's likely in tears as he said goodbye to the man whom he loved and respected more than anyone else in the world. And as he reads, he's realizing that Paul is in prison once again, and this time he's going to be executed for his faith. I can only imagine the great heartache and struggle in which Timothy received this news. In a very real sense, Paul is on his deathbed, and in this letter we get to see the last recorded words that the Apostle Paul writes to his dearest son in the faith, Timothy. And as I've studied this book, it's really given me a clear understanding of what gospel ministry looks like and what it will take to fulfill my calling and all of our callings to evangelize the world. I know we already read it this morning, but let's look at chapter 1, verse 1. We'll read through verse 7. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy when I call to the remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this time. Father, we are so grateful, Lord, to know you, Lord, that you're our Savior, that you made a way for us to be reunited in relationship with you. Lord, I just pray that you bless this time, that the preaching of your word would be faithful. Lord, we thank you that your word will not return void. I just ask that you would work in all of our hearts and encourage us where we need to be encouraged, convict us where we need to be convicted. And Lord, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Paul really begins his final exhortation to Timothy in verse 6 by saying, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I think first it's important to notice here that Paul says to stir up the gift of God that is in him. Another way that this is translated is to kindle afresh or to keep in full flame. So Paul here is giving the idea of rekindling an existing fire. Well, this resonates closely with me because, like I said, I grew up in outer Mongolia where it would reach negative 50 degree weather at times. And my chore as a kid was to keep the fire going and to prepare the wood. So I had to go out and chop the wood, stack the wood, cut the kindling, bring in the wood to the house and start the fire and then continue to keep the fire going all day and sometimes even through the night so that we wouldn't freeze. If there's anything I've learned, it's that a fire left to itself will always burn out. It takes work and intentionality to keep the fire going, to keep it in full flame. And so Peter, or Paul is telling Peter to be very intentional with his gift, to exercise it, to use it so that it might gain strength 
and be so that he might gain strength and so that he might be effective in his call. Now, there are a few different views on what the gift of God is that Paul is saying to stir up. You know, some say that the gift is actually the spirit of God himself. Others say that it is maybe a specific gift, such as the gift of teaching or so on. But whichever view you take, it is there's truth to both in that what enabled and qualified and empowered Timothy was the spirit of God. And what Timothy had been empowered to do was to do the work of an evangelist. We see this throughout 2 Timothy and most clearly in chapter 4, verse 5, when Paul says, do the work of an evangelist. And doing the work of an evangelist meant that he was un called to unashamedly preach about Jesus Christ and suffer for the sake of the gospel. Right? Doing the work of an evangelist meant that he was to unashamedly preach about Jesus Christ and do and suffer for the sake of the gospel. You know, as believers, we too are called to suffer for the sake of the gospel, to preach about Jesus Christ, to share the good news with those around us. And like Timothy, I believe our first step would be to stir up the gift of God within us rather than let our Christian walk grow lukewarm and cold. We need to be intentional and work hard at our God-given calling, calling to make disciples and evangelize those around us. Look at verse 7, that first phrase, God has not given us a spirit of fear, reflects the reality that Paul and Timothy find themselves in. As we mentioned, as Paul is writing, he's suffering in prison, and he's being faced with execution. And the temp as Timothy hears this, I'm sure that the temptation to be afraid, the temptation to be discouraged, and the temptation to even question is in many ways at an all-time high as he Here's a maybe what his own future holds, the same type of suffering that Paul has experienced. And because of that reality, Paul tells him, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but rather of power and love and a sound mind. It seems from the passage that fear is what would actually hold Timothy back from doing what he was called to do. And oftentimes fear is exactly what holds us back from doing what we're called to do in making disciples. And sharing the gospel with our neighbor. It's the fear of man, maybe. Or the fear of losing possessions. Maybe the fear of missing out on our dreams. Maybe the fear of losing loved ones. Maybe the fear of even losing our own life. I don't think it's coincidence that in the Bible, the phrase, do not be afraid, is written 365 times. One for each day of the year. If we are to make a difference in evangelizing our communities, we must deny our fears and recognize that God has not given us a spirit of fear. So Timothy was called to unashamedly preach about Jesus Christ and suffer for the sake of the gospel by putting his fear aside and walking boldly in the spirit that God had given him. And we too are called to turn from our fear and boldly do the work of evangelists through the spirit that God has given us. We see in 2 Timothy that God gives us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind for three main reasons. So point number one, God has given us the spirit of power to endure affliction unashamedly for the gospel's sake. I'll say it again. God has given us the spirit of power to endure affliction unashamedly for the gospel's sake. We see this throughout 2 Timothy and starting in chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Be not thou therefore... Ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. In verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 3. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So just like Paul, Timothy was called to partake of the afflictions of the gospel, to suffer for the sake of the gospel, and to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And we as believers also share in this same calling to endure for the gospel's sake. And remember that when 
those sufferings and the trials and the hardships come, we have everything that we need to endure already, and it is the spirit of power to persevere. But what does it look like to endure for the sake of the gospel? Well, when I think of someone that I know personally who has endured hardness well, one in particular stands out the most to me. So my father, Mickey Kofer, in 1999, had a comfortable life, healthy family, was serving faithfully in the church, had a highly successful pottery business doing what he loved to do, and he was getting close to finishing a home he had built from the ground up and setting up his dream homestead he'd been working on for seven years. He was beginning to live the Christian American dream. And as this all took place, he continued to pray daily, telling the Lord he was willing to do anything for him. He was surrendered and was a man of prayer. And during those days of seeking the Lord, God called my father to outer Mongolia. In 2003, at 40 years old, he left behind his established business and dream home and moved his family of six to the northern Mongolian tundra. And during the years I lived there from the time I was four years old, I witnessed in my father what it takes to continue on in ministry. It was the spirit of power to endure. I learned endurance goes hand in hand with ministry. and Without it, you cannot succeed. Well, the first year, all six of us lived in a gear, which is a one room, 20 square foot round tent like structure that's walls and top are covered in sheep wool. And for seven years, we learned to live without electricity, running water, Internet, a phone. We learned to bathe and wash our clothes in the river. Even when it was negative 10 at times, we had to scoop out water out of the river and cut a hole in the ice in order to get it. But we learned to survive in and embrace that weather. And we learned to survive and embrace the outhouse during negative 50 degree weather. I must say the inch thick ice on the toilet seat took some endurance. But more than those smaller physical struggles of a third world country, endurance was needed when eight months or 18 months into ministering in Mongolia, my brother Jonah was in a horrific horse accident. His horse was spooked by a dog and the horse took off and Jonah fell to the ground only to find his foot caught in the stirrup. He was drugged close to 100 yards while being kicked several times in the head and jaw until by the grace of God, the stirrup broke. My dad was there to witness all of it. And when he came to Jonah, how my dad describes it is that Jonah was curled up in a ball, unconscious in a pool of blood. Because of the remoteness of where we were living, it took him 40 hours before he could get Jonah to good medical care. And once he arrived, the doctors confirmed that there was very little chance of survival and if he lived, there would likely be major brain damage and other side effects. Well, he laid in the hospital for, in a coma for three weeks. In those 21 days while Jonah was laying there, my dad never questioned the Lord's goodness and never wavered from his foundation in Christ. He prayed night and day and acted in a way that showed complete trust and faith in God no matter what happened to his son. Well, the Lord healed Jonah in a miraculous way, and today he has no side effects from that incident. After Jonah was a couple months into intensive rehab, my dad felt strongly that he needed to return to the village in Mongolia. So my mom and Jonah went to the States to continue on rehab for the next year, while my dad took me and my siblings to continue the mission in Mongolia. The interesting, the interesting thing is that the nine months of ministry leading up to Jonah's accident, my father had been preaching Sunday after Sunday for creation to Christ to the group of Mongolians there. And the Sunday prior to Jonah's accident, he told them, Next Sunday, I will tell you about the Deliverer, the Savior of the world. He had been building them up to really preach the gospel. Then the accident happened, and we were gone for three months. The first Sunday back, my father preached the gospel to that same group, and 21 Mongolians put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And that was the birth of the church in Hopkins. I have no doubt the Lord used that trial and my father's faithfulness to the Lord's calling to bring breakthrough in the Mongolian hearts for the first time. A year later in 2006, my dad was really content in leading this new church plant and preparing a Mongolian man to take his position. But the Lord had given him a vision that reached far past our village to include the entire nation. This multifaceted ministry would include youth camp to win the youth for Christ, a leadership training facility to train and further the discipleship of church leaders, pastors, and missionaries a printing warehouse to print tens of thousands of Bibles to flood the country with the word of God. Well, the Lord provided an old 150,000 square foot Soviet Union factory in order to make that vision a reality. My father knew that this project was so much bigger than himself. And when we first acquired the property, I remember him telling us 
that we telling all of us kids that he needed to go to pray. And a few days into that, my mom had me send or sent me to bring him some warmer clothing. And I remember this moment very clearly because it made a lifelong impact on me. It was cold outside, several of inches of snow on the ground. It was the dead of winter. And I went into this abandoned old factory, no heating, where I found him on his knees in his long johns on and a pile of ashes crying out to the Lord. I have no doubt he was feeling the weight of the calling and asking for wisdom, endurance, and provision. And he spent many weeks over the next years praying and fasting, asking for the helps and funds needed to complete the task entrusted to him. To this day, he's still faithfully doing ministry, discipling men, serving in the background of our Hot of Hothel Baptist Church, and day by day renovating this massive facility. I believe one of the main reasons that the Lord chose him to accomplish this vision is because he was the one that would endure day by day no matter the trial. And there have been many other hardships he has had to endure throughout the last 20 years, and in them all the Lord Jesus is manifesting the spirit of power in and through him. And as a result of his endurance and God's grace, hundreds of people are coming to and growing the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So God has given us this spirit of power to endure affliction for the sake of the gospel. Point number two, God has given us a spirit of love to serve sacrificially for the salvation of souls. God has given us a spirit of love to serve sacrificially for the salvation of souls. We see this from both Paul and Timothy's lives. In 2 Timothy 2.10, it says, Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Right, we've read of the sacrifices that Paul made. I think of the passage in 2 Corinthians where Paul says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the sea, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils of the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Now, Paul laid down his life daily so that souls might be saved and cared for. But I think of the verse, greater love hath no man than this, than a man laid down his life for his friends. When we see the same spirit of love in Timothy, when Paul sent him to care the, for the believers at Philippi. Philippians 2, 19 through 22 says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. This loving care that Paul and Timothy had is, Further illustrated in 2 Thessalonians when Paul says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. You know, I think these verses really show what knit Paul and Timothy's hearts so close together. It's that they both possess the same spirit of love that was needed to sacrificially serve for the sake of the gospel. I know, like them, we need to be caring for, cherishing, willingly serving those around us. Now, I direct the Braveheart Youth Camp in Outer Mongolia in the village of Hotspur. And each year I plan and hold youth camp for teenagers aged 13 to 18. And this summer uh, we held four weeks of youth camp that served about 400 campers. And every summer, I'm amazed at the fruit of youth camp. It blows me away because we see many teams born again. We see many get involved in their churches back home. And some even from our village get involved at our church there in, the, in Hotko. And we also see many begin their process of discipleship. 
And this year, by God's grace, we had 166 young people give their life to Christ. I think there are many things that contribute to this fruit, but I know a major part is we have staff, Mongolian staff, that genuinely love Jesus and love people. People that get up early and stay up late to meet needs. People who give their time and sacrifice their resources. They're people who naturally care for these campers. I believe our staff cherish people, and I know that a major part of why so many teenagers are coming to Christ is because they are experiencing this spirit of love, of the spirit of love of Christ, really, through these surrenders believers. And this is only possible because God has given us a spirit of love to serve sacrificially for the gospel's sake. Number three, God has given us a spirit of a sound mind to hold fast to the truth. God has given us a spirit of a sound mind to hold fast to the truth. We see this throughout Paul's letter to Timothy, starting in chapter 1, verse 13. It says, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, and faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. In chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. In chapter 4, verse 2 and 4, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap in themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. You know, much like we are today, Timothy was facing an unbelieving generation. And in those times, he was charged to hold to the truth, to study the word, to teach sound doctrine, and to preach the gospel. He was called to commit to faithful men, to convince the gainsayers, and to convict the rebels. And Paul knew that Timothy could do this because he had been given the Holy Scriptures and the spirit of a sound mind that holds to the truth. And we have been given these same scriptures and this same spirit, and with it we're called to cherish it, to study it, to live out the truth, and to boldly proclaim the truth to those around us. This summer, I met a young man, man named Bender, and Bender uh, was really just a 14-year-old kid, and I had several opportunities to talk to him, and during one of our conversations, he it was really clear that he was really closed off to Christianity. Well, later, I found out that his grandma was a shaman, which is basically a witch doctor, and shamanism is the main religion that is in Mongolia, and both of his parents strongly adhered to shamanism. Well, I asked him to come to camp, and he told me that he wanted to, but his mom wouldn't allow it unless he could sit out of all the services, because he didn't want him to be under the preaching of the word. So I talked to his mom and explained that campers had to attend all events, but I ensured her that we'd take good care of him. We'd even pay his way if she would allow him to go, and she gave her permission. So after a week of Bender being at camp and hearing powerful preaching, Bender came to me and told me that he decided to follow Christ. Well, on the last night of camp, we prayed together and he called on the Lord as his personal savior. And I share all that to say that what Bender needed and what so many of those around us need is to hear the word of God because that is what convinces the mind and changes the heart. And we must hold to it and share it. And the spirit of God will do what only he can do and bring people to repentance and faith. Well, in conclusion, and I won't take much more of your time, but Paul opens his charge with stir up the, God, the gift of God that is in you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And Paul ends his final exhortation in chapter 4, verse 5, by saying, Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. But Timothy was to endure afflictions through the spirit that perseveres, spirit of power that perseveres. 
He was to do the work of the evangelist through the spirit of love that serves sacrificially. And he was to watch in all things through the same through the spirit of a sound mind that holds on to the truth. And we are called to do the same through the same spirit that God has given us. And through doing these things, you make full proof of your ministry. Or in other words, you do what God has called you to do. In 2 Timothy, we see that Paul made full proof of his ministry. And when his life and ministry was coming to an end, he had full confidence in death and an abundant entrance into Christ's presence. Verse 6 through 8 says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I believe part of what Paul is telling Timothy and all of us is I fulfill what God called me to do. And if you also do the work through fiercely, fearlessly walking in this spirit of power, love and a sound mind, you will make full proof of your ministry. And one day say with me, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith.